Well, hey, friends, welcome to the Vintage Truth Podcast, and I'm Jeff Kinley. And listen, I got to tell you about a couple of things that uh, are just, you know, when you have good news, you just want to share it with everybody. Well, I got two really good news items for you here today. The first is my new book. It's called The End of the World According to Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, this book is going to blow your mind. It's taken right from the Olivet Discourse, and it's how to see the last days, and specifically the time of tribulation through the eyes of Jesus himself, through his very words. And what Christ does is, is he really uh, takes us on a backstage pass journey, if you will, uh, it through the, the, the time of tribulation up to the, his second coming and even afterwards. And he does it uh, through a very unique Jewish perspective. So you're going to want to pick this book up. It, it releases Ju uh, July 9th. But you can pre-order it right now on Amazon. So listen, go on over there right now. Get your copy reserved. And uh, you're going to love this book. It's a deep dive deal. And it also helps you in understanding why Jesus is uniquely qualified to make these kind of prophecies. So I highly encourage you to jump on over to Amazon or your favorite book distributor and uh, pick up a copy of this uh, today. Okay, so that's the first good news item. I'm very excited about this because I know it's going to really encourage uh, your heart and uh, really equip you uh, in your depth of understanding of Scripture. The second thing I, I let, need to let you know is that we are moving uh, forward. We have taken big steps uh, towards uh, getting out of this small space into uh, a proper studio space for this ministry that will actually aid everything from the Vintage Truth podcast to Jeff Kinley Live uh, to, uh, to the Prophecy Pros. I mean, it impacts a lot of things in my ministry, plus enables me uh, to, to spread my creative wings and to be able to produce more video content for you guys uh, in ways that I've never been able to do before. So all that to say is uh, we, we are moving forward, but I need your help. You know, someone once said that, that many hands make light work. In other words, if you've got a heavy object to lift, and you can't lift it by yourself. You, you truly need other people to help you lift it. Uh, but when five or 10 or 20 or 100 people get around that heavy object, all of a sudden you find yourself going, I'm only lifting about a pound or two. Well, that's the way the body of Christ is. We've been talking about that in the book of Ephesians, how the body helps the body. And uh, this, this person, <laughs> this body needs your help in helping me get to this. So uh, basically it boils down to uh, monthly contributions, which you can uh, you can sign up for with, with any amount. You can go to jeffkinley.com, click on that donate tab, and there'll be an option there on the donate tab to give to the general fund of this ministry or to the studio fund. And, and just to let you know, it costs money to do ministry. It costs money to produce these programs, uh, to make this programming available to you. And every little bit helps. So you may be the kind of person that says, Jeff, uh, I want to be a monthly kind of person for you, be alongside you every month to help these things uh, go on and help you get into the studio and, and get it set up the way you need it to be. Uh, so a monthly might be the way you go. You may be the one-time donation person. That's fine too. But whatever God leads you to do, or if he doesn't lead you to do that, that's fine too. But I do need you. And I desperately need you to pray uh, because we are we're no turning back here. I mean, listen, our time on this earth is short. My time is short. I'm going to make it count regardless. And so I am moving forward. I'm pressing forward by faith. And we're going to get into this studio and we're going to make uh, some incredible content for the body of Christ to help wake the bride, revive her, get her wedding garments on and help her be prepared for the soon return of Jesus Christ. So uh, anyway, that's the, the other good news. So we are moving forward. So I want you to be a part of that. Go to jeffkinley.com. And there's a video you can look at on the front uh, of the page there if you want to watch that. It's like 10 minutes long or so. Uh, but if not, you just want to say, Jeff, I'm here with you. I support you. I stand with you. Go to that donate tab and join in with others who are saying we want to make a difference in the last days. Okay, now it's time to dive into the book of Ephesians. And uh, we left off last time at Ephesians 4.19. We were talking about the, the attitude, the mindset, the philosophy, the behavior, the lifestyles of the Gentiles or of the unsaved. And, and, and this is a just a telling passage. I mean, Paul really does sort of peel back the carpet and let us see what's underneath uh, the, the motivation behind why people do what they do. And we talked about last time 
that there's a certain futility of a mindset uh, that non-Christians have. Now, it doesn't mean that every non-Christian is as evil as he or she can be, but it does mean that that the their conclusions about life, about God, about eternity, about the future, about sexuality, about their own identity, all those things are skewed to varying degrees based upon the fact that they have rejected the Creator being uh, the one in charge of their life, and they don't know Christ personally. So we talked about that. We talked about the darkness of their minds and, and what all that uh, leads to. So Paul now pivots, and he says, in verse 20, he says, but you did not learn Christ this way. In other words, you are not saved to stay the same. Can I say that again? You are not saved to stay the same. There is a change that occurs in, in the heart, beginning in the heart of, of every person who professes faith in Jesus Christ, who genuinely places their trust in Jesus for their salvation. Say, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. I'm a sinner. I need you. I believe that what you did on the cross was for me. I trust you now with my life, and I trust you with my salvation. When you do that, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there is an automatic, instant, unseen, but very real change that takes place in your heart. Uh, Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be, is in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, he is he's, The old things have passed away, the whole new things have come. So we are new creations in Christ. Based upon that, we've been born into a, a new family, and therefore we have a, a new destiny. New, we have new obligations. We have a new mindset. We have a new identity. We have a new nature. And that new nature craves the things that Paul is going to tell us about in the rest of Ephesians. That new nature rejects, or at least desires to reject, the old self and the old life. Now, when I was saved, un unlike a lot of people, I get this, but when I was saved, it was a radical transformation. I mean, literally from one moment and a few seconds later, I was a different person altogether. Now, it wasn't emotional. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel any different in terms of my emotions, uh, but I knew inside something had changed. Why? Because I had believed on Jesus and surrendered my life to him. So I, I was, it was an automatic thing. Many of you may have become Christians at a young age, and, and at any age, we don't really understand all that that means to become a Christian. But as a child, you just understand some basic things. And depending upon whether or not you were then uh, nurtured and you know brought out of uh, out of uh, infant care, you know home, and you were given milk and and uh, your diaper was changed and you were nurtured and taken care of, depending on how much that happened for you spiritually, that determined how much you grew in the Lord. And a lot of people became believers at a young age, or but there was some gap period between the time they really came to Christ and they started realizing what that meant and started to grow in their faith. So that's okay. I get that. If that's part of your experience, look, just write it off. It's a past, but, but here you are now, right? And so what Paul is saying is, is that there is a, an inward change in our hearts that should lead uh, to an outward change. It should change the way we think, the way we believe, the way we relate, the way we act, the way we behave, everything. It changes everything about us. And of course, all of our lives is this tension, this break in the gas pedal tension between the old self and the new self. In fact, I wrote an entire book about that uh, several years ago called The Christian Zombie Killer's Handbook. And I wrote it uh, for, for this younger generation because this whole idea of zombies was so, so huge, exploding back then with television shows and movies and that kind of thing. And so I wrote a full, straight up zombie novel. And then the, 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 every other chapter was a deep dive biblically into the sin nature. And so it's kind of, you get kind of both you get the entertainment of the zombie world, but you also get the, the deep dive. And in that book, I talk about the sin nature, what it is, how it works, and how do I overcome it? So you and I, to varying degrees, we will struggle daily with sin uh, to the day we die. Some sins 
that we struggle with uh, drop off. I mean, they just kind of fall by the wayside and, and we really no longer struggle with them. And, and you know, there are certain sins that I, they were a part of my former life that I, I, ne I literally never think about. It, they, they never, if you were to tempt me with it today, I would laugh, right? But like all of us, there are, are other sins that tend to hang on, they, they linger. Maybe they were more uh, integrated into our personhood as an unbeliever and they're harder to extract. And so there, you have these ruts in our minds and in our spirits of, of thinking and believing. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Well, either way, you know, Paul said in Romans 7 that, uh, that we, all, uh, we all struggle with, with sin. And, and he struggled with sin. He said, the thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do, I end up doing. You know, wretched man that I am, right? So Paul struggled with that. Uh, and that's why he's helping these Ephesian believers uh, overcome uh, that sin in, in their life. So he says, you didn't learn Christ in the way that the Gentiles walk. In other words, you didn't learn to come to Christ and then go back and be like you were. And, and this just highlights the fact that there are some people, and, and perhaps you know them, who claim the name of Christ, but their life doesn't look like that at all. I mean, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't represent Jesus or anything, or the Bible, or anything the Bible says. They believe things that the Bible says don't believe. Uh, they embrace realities that the Bible condemns. Uh, they are open to philosophies that Scripture says are heretical. And, and you go, wait a minute, some, some, there's a huge disconnect here. So a true Christian is one that eventually embraces Scripture and embraces the true Christ and lives that way. Now, again, not perfectly, but at least we're moving in the right direction. That's the point, right? You, you want to keep falling forward and not falling backward. So here's what he says, verse 20. Uh, he says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed, Paul puts in this little qualification here, qualifier, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. So he's saying, de depending upon the amount of teaching that you've gotten after your, your post-conversion experience, you may or might, may, may not know how to live for Christ. And a lot of people's struggle with sin and with, with falling back into worldly patterns again, some of it, not all of it, but some of it has to do with, with, with uh, absent teaching and faulty teaching and shallow teaching. And it all goes back at once again to what he talks about in the beginning of this chapter, uh, about uh, the middle part of this chapter, about pastors and their role to equip the saints. That's why, that's why the Ministry Youth Podcast exists is to supplement your Bible teaching to help you be equipped and so you can be strong in the Lord. Well, to the degree that you receive that teaching and that you're stronger, you're not going to fall into those patterns like you would if you didn't have that teaching. So some of it, Paul says, has to do with, have you heard Christ to begin with? Have you really heard the true Christ? So that'd be a question to ask someone or for someone to ask themselves, if they say, yeah, I, I trusted Jesus at age five or age 10 or whatever, uh, but my life has never changed a bit. I've never thought differently, believed differently, whatever. My friend, that's a that's like 10 alarm bells going off uh, from inside. And that's God saying, you need to check your salvation to see if it's real. It, it, Paul even said to the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see if you're truly in the faith or not. So if you've truly heard, have you really heard Christ? Have you heard the true Christ? Not, not the Christ, the, the, not the woke Jesus of the world, uh, not the, the Jesus just accepts everything and everybody, regardless of what they, how they want to live their life, uh, that is true of many churches today, uh, not the hipster Jesus, you know, not the friend Jesus who just comes alongside, not just the Jesus who gets us. No, I'm talking about the, the risen, exalted, sovereign Lord Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for sin, who gloriously rose from the grave, who ascended to heaven, who's preparing a place for his bride right now, and who's coming back to rescue them, who's then going to pour out wrath on the earth for seven years, and then come back in Revelation 19 and slaughter his enemies, set up a thousand-year kingdom where he's going to reign righteously. And then he's going to judge the living and the dead at the great white throne judgment. That Jesus. Have you heard that Jesus? That's the question that, uh, that people really need to ask themselves. So have you heard him? And then he says, have you been taught uh, in him? 
because he says truth is in Jesus. So if you haven't been taught in Christ, in other words, you haven't been taught in the scripture, then you don't know the real God. The Jesus that you believe in is a Jesus that you have conjured up in your own mind. And that is nothing but idolatry. So we have to be very careful. I say this with great compassion and love. We have to be very careful that we don't create concepts of Christ based upon our own minds and based upon what we wish him to be or what we think the first day in heaven is going to be like or what we hope that in terms of how he would relate to us or what we've heard about him. It's not just that. You've got to get what you believe about Jesus straight from the Bible. That's the only Jesus that, that God accepts. And that's the only Jesus that you're going to really be able to say, I know God. I know him personally. All right, let's keep going here. This is now the application one. He says that in reference to your former manner of life, that you lay aside the old self. The old self is the sin nature, the zombie within. Uh, it, it destroys, it kills, it does nothing but drag you down. Uh, it rejects God. It resists God and it runs from God. That's the part of you and the part of me that the Bible calls the old self or the old nature or the old man, the sinful nature, the flesh. Okay. And so that's a part of all of us, right? But watch this. He says, lay it aside, uh, take it off, put it aside. Just, just shove it to the edge of your life where it's not even uh, in, in your life anymore. Lay it aside. Uh, he says here, he talks about that old self. He says, which is being corrupted according with the lusts of deceit. Now watch this. Paul is saying that your sin nature and my sin nature, present tense, is being corrupted. Is being corrupted. And, and that word corrupted just means to just rot, basically. In other words, uh, it doesn't get any better. I mean, we can't just put more makeup on the old self or, or prop it up, or give it some New Year's resolutions and expect it to improve. It can't improve. That's why works salvation is so ludicrous to even think about, thinking that you can do anything that would add to God's acceptance of you in terms of salvation. Work salvation is futile because the old nature can't improve itself. Here's what it can do. It can and does get worse and worse and worse. So what do you mean by that? Well, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like one time we um, we were uh, opened up our car door one time and, and got in the car and, and someone said, what in the world is that smell? And we looked and looked, couldn't find it. Pretty soon we looked underneath the seat, uh, the front seat. And what happened was a grocery bag uh, a few days earlier had fallen over and, and a, a little roll of meat had rolled up underneath the front seat and it was in the summer and it was 90 plus degrees and it stayed in that that car with the windows rolled up for for a couple days and my friend there is nothing well i'll say nothing there are few things that smell worse than rotted meat well that meat uh was not going to get better by leaving it outside it's only going to get worse and worse and worse and in a similar way, that's exactly how our old sin nature is. Uh, it can't it can't be improved upon. That's why Paul said, lay it aside. That's why he says in Galatians 2.20, for, for I've been crucified with Christ. That's why Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 25 and following, you have to die to yourself because that self is not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. This is why we should never follow the dictates and the philosophies of the world as it says, listen to your heart. What does your heart tell you to do? You know what my heart tells me to do? It tells me to lie, cheat, steal, to lust, to deceive. You say, Jeff, are you, are you that bad? Well, my old self is. Sure it is. There is nothing good there. I can't improve that. Look, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the human heart is deceitful uh, and, and more deceitful than any other thing on the planet. That's what he says. Uh, who can understand it, he says. The, the, the answer is no one can understand it because it's it's so deceitful. And Paul repeats the same thing here. He says that old self is being corrupted uh, in accordance with the lusts or the desires of deceit, deceitful desires. Now, here's the thing. And, and this is kind of a, 
You know, I think it was, uh, was it Aristotle or Pythagorean, uh, who, Pythagoras who said, know thyself. Maybe it was a, a, a Aristotle. And I don't know all what he meant by that, but listen, it, it's kind of good medicine. And here's why. When we understand the patterns and the default modes of our old nature, that alerts us to to lay the old self aside and to be filled with the spirit and to live according to God's uh, God's uh, design for our lives. Knowing yourself, knowing your weaknesses, knowing your tendencies, knowing, hey, when I get into this kind of X situation, this is how I typically respond. When someone criticizes me or when I uh, get into a situation where, oh, I find out I've got to do a car repair. Now, now I've got to pay money that I didn't know. And I now get depressed or I get anxious. When do you have panic attacks? When do I get anxious? When do you get down? When do you get depressed? Uh, when do you get upset? When do you get angry? Uh, when do you get, um, you know, just mediocre? When do you become, fl when do you flatline spiritually? Knowing yourself and knowing how you typically respond to different situations and people and even emotions in your own heart, knowing that will help you avoid the deceptiveness of the old sin nature. Because here's what happens. Our old sin natures know, know us, right? And so we will lie to ourselves. We will purpose, well, not purposefully, we will unconsciously deceive ourselves into thinking something that is not true. And so that is why we have to lay aside, when we say lay aside the old self, not just the, the quote unquote evil desires, but the desires that are not pure or godly, the thoughts that are not scriptural. We have unscriptural thoughts about who God is, lay them aside. We have unbiblical expectations of things that we expect God to do that are not found in the scripture, lay them aside. Uh, we have selfish motives, lay them aside. We have selfish thoughts. We think that the world revolves around us. We interpret situations and group situations, family gatherings, uh, uh, work uh, situations, uh, school happenings. We interpret those as if the whole world is doing something against us. And, and we react based upon how we feel, not based upon what God says. So, lay it aside. So it's those, it's those natural, unbiblical emotions that we have to know about ourselves so that we can avoid uh, these lusts, these desires that are deceitful, Paul says. Isn't that great advice? Isn't that incredible counsel? And look, we all have them. I have them. I'm just a human being. So we all have these things. So I would encourage you to ask God, as, as, as David did in Psalm 139, God, search my heart. Search my heart. I think it's Psalm 139. Search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. In other words, God, I'm going to like expose my heart and let you x-ray and MRI my spirit uh, through reading your word. As James says, the word is a mirror. We hold up the word. We see ourselves. Listen, when we do that, then, then we're able to, uh, to allow God to diagnose some of these tendencies, weaknesses, sins, deceitful desires. And, and we're like, all of a sudden, like, okay, I see it. And, you know, you might be bold enough and, and know someone that you love and trust enough to be able to say, hey, what do you see in me? What do you see are my tendencies that when I'm in a certain situation, I tend to be like this, that that tends to be not what God would say, but more kind of a self-motivated or self-centered kind of thing. What do you see in me? Uh, to be kind of courageous and bold, but you may know someone, maybe your husband or wife or friend, best friend, or whatever, that you could ask about that. But more, even more than that, allowing Scripture to speak into it and, and praying through prayer, God, reveal these things, reveal, purify me of the old self so that I can lay it aside, so I can know what it is, know how it works in me and lay it aside. So what do we do um, in, in place of, of that, in place of allowing the, the deceitful desires of the old self to, to manage us, to dictate us, to direct us, to guide us, to rule us, what do we do? Look at the next verse. He says, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewed. That's a great word. Re renewed is like if you were to call in uh, just a cleaning crew and they just 
cleans your whole house for you. And it's just spick and span. Renewed is when you go through that car wash and you get detailed on the inside of your car. Uh, renewed is when you when you take a shower after you're out mowing the yard, the yard or, or working in the garden or playing a sport, or whatever, and you take that refreshing shower knowing we're about to grill out, you know, some, some great burgers or steaks on the grill. Being renewed. But our minds need that. And the way that we renew our minds is with the, the washing of the water with the word. In fact, the very next chapter, uh, when he talks about husbands and wives, he says that husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and, and Christ gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify her, set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And so what, what the word of God does, it's like taking a bath, you know? I mean, taking a great shower, you just feel great. And when we spend time in God's Word, and I hope the Venice Truth Podcast does that for you. I hope you feel so great uh, in terms of, of how God is renewing your mind after you listen, after you watch this podcast. But watch, that, watch this. He says to renew your mind uh, in the spirit of your mind. And, and this is the same principle that Paul talks to the Romans about in Romans 12 too, when he says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world press you into its mold. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And listen, if God can get a hold of our minds, he's got us. You say, wait a minute, what about the heart? Listen, God always begins with the mind. Did you know that? God doesn't just touch your heart and you're, you're different. No, it begins with the mind. It begins with processing Biblical truth, revelation from God is found in Scripture. You process that. You embrace it. You receive it. You believe on it. You meditate on it. And you act upon it. And it becomes a part of the, of the, the operational system of your mind. That's what renewing your mind is. And so when, when you and I uh, spend time in the Scriptures and we, we get into the Bible, we let the Bible get into us then what happens is we're new and, and it all begins right here. Because why? Because God made the brain, God made the mind and God made the, your, to, the totality of your person, your spirit and your will to interact and to relate to your mind and to take that truth and translate it down into your life. And, and then you can make decisions based upon the truth that you've in, in, interacted with. You say, wait a minute, where are the emotions in this, Jeff? Well, you, you might have emotions, but you might not. You might actually have some negative emotions through doing it because that's not your norm. Don't listen to those emotions. But eventually, you're going to feel joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have the patience. You're going to have love. Why? Because that truth is just cleansing you over and over and over again. Well, so we're going to stop right there. We'll pick up uh, next time in verse 24 of Ephesians 4. So listen, hop on over to Amazon, grab a copy of this book right here, The End of the World According to Jesus of Nazareth. I guarantee you, you're going to absolutely be thrilled and equipped by this book. And then also go to jeffkinley.com and prayerfully consider, Jeff, I want to be on the team. I want to be on board uh, in helping you uh, get into this studio. It's going to happen. And I just want you to be a part of it because many hands make light work. All right. I'll see you next time on the Ministry Podcast. God bless.